Our first speaker will be Dr. Rabino. He's an associate professor with the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. He works as a team physician uh, for Miami University Middletown as well as the University of Dayton. He'll be going over common injuries of the shoulder. So please welcome Dr. Rabino. Could just sit here, right? Hey, Karen. Oh. You're not going to move around. Well, maybe I'll sit there. Right. Oh, well, good morning. It's pretty fancy there. Perfect. I'm Joe Rubino, one of the uh, associate professors over at Wright State uh, University. I was uh, happy to be here this morning, and please, as I go through this, do not hesitate to stop and um, ask questions. You can interrupt or just raise your hand, but uh, stop me as, as you see fit. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but we can go and get started. Today, we're going to talk about common injuries of the shoulder. And basically, what we're going to look at is uh, shoulder separations shoulder dislocations, rotator cuff tears, some fractures, and then some burners, stingers, those type of things. So in what we do in covering sports and whatnot for the various schools, maybe the videos are not gonna play. I'm not sure, let's see here. Doesn't look like that's going to play for me, typical fashion. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to fix this real quick here. Sorry about that. This is why we started early, I guess. So what we can do is take that, put that on the desktop. No, uh, no, the whole folder. Otherwise, it won't. Otherwise, it won't link to the video. At least that's my my understanding. And this with this I'll do. Go back here. Okay. This ortho symposium needs to go to my desktop. Once that's done, we can switch this back over. Okay, well, you can pop that one out and then. Slideshow. Where is that thing? Slideshow. All right, we're going to start over now. Okay, so sorry about that. So again, we're talking about these. These are the topics we're going to talk about today. Again, stop as we go through uh, at any time. So typical sports scenario: wrestling tournament. You know, it's a high risk sport. You have got a kid with a shoulder injury. Young kids, a high school match, high school meet here. And then, you know, one of the most common things we do see is shoulder dislocations. And 
typically as you dislocate your shoulder, you're going to lever the humeral head out the front. So you get your arm out extended, typically abducted a little bit, and it just levers on out with the shallow glenoid. Very small subset of them will go out the back, but that's a whole different type of, type of problem. Um, this is the type of thing you may see you know, on a football game at high school level. You see them at wrestling meets. You see them all the way you know, up to older people who have slips and falls. But the type of thing you can usually pretty easily pop back into the socket. So if you're on a field or whatnot, or training room, you can usually get these shoulders back in relatively easily, especially right away, because they don't get tense. They're pretty, you know, they already injure themselves, they're loose. Um, pretty easy to do. So it's a slow and steady pull of some traction. Sometimes you just let them lay flat on the table with their arm hang off, let gravity help, and it'll pop back in. There's some easy ways to get them back in, but something worth putting back in if you can when you see it, because it makes it a lot easier. Um, otherwise, they end up in the emergency room and, you, and, you know, they get sedated and it's a little bit more of a, a difficult problem. Um, but once you get them back in, what do you do? And they need to get x-rays because you need to confirm that you did an adequate job reducing them and make sure nothing's broken. This would be a typical series of x-rays. On the left, you see the shoulder not in the socket. So if you're looking at, it's kind of obvious here, but this is the glenoid here, the humeral head's here, it all should be out here. Okay, so again, over here, glenoid, humeral head, they should be articulating. And the view on the right side is what was done in the emergency room, and this is their reduction view. So they put it back in, they got this x-ray, said everything's okay. Well, that's not actually okay, because you need to see that in more than one view. You really can't tell if that's it or not. So one of the things you need to do, ought to do, every time is get what's called an axillary lateral x-ray after every dislocation. And frankly, it probably should be part of every shoulder evaluation. And that is this series here. So this is your typical anterior to posterior view here, now, and this is your axillary lateral. Now this has a big defect here from the dislocation. We've got a big defect here, it's called a hill sax lesion, okay? And if you can see that over there, this is a defect here, and you can't see that one, but uh, messed up there. And there, that defect right here is an indentation in the humeral head that happens when it dislocates and impacts against the glenoid. But the point of this is that you can see very clearly that the glenoid and humeral head line up, despite the humeral head not being in great position. So once you've seen those two extras, you know that you can be confident that the shoulder is reduced and that there's no issues with a missed or a perched or subluxed shoulder that's going to give them longer term problems. And it's just a schematic of this showing the same thing. Um, the typical injury or the classic injury people have when they have a dislocation, and typically this is a younger person, is a bank art tear. And that's this on the far right of your screen where the labrum anteriorly gets pulled off of the glenoid. Other things that can happen, you see the hill sacs on the top left. Um, <clears throat> you can have a reverse hill sacs lesion if it goes out the back. So it's the same mechanism, but you know, reverse it. You can break bone on the glenoid, and that's always a, a potential problem as well. But this is basically what you're looking at when you see your uh, post-op axillary lateral x-rays. So what do you do next? So you see them in the emergency rooms, in the training room, you know, sling for comfort is appropriate right away. Um, ice really helps a lot, especially getting, the, uh, getting them early. And then once they're comfortable, they can start moving. Um, there's no set date or days where you need to mobilize them for a week or two weeks or three weeks. It's really when they get comfortable, they start moving. When they start moving better, they can start strengthening. And then once they can strengthen and they're symmetrically strong, they can go back and play or do whatever they want to do. Um, it's not a surgical problem necessarily. There is some controversy about that, but generally speaking, it's not a surgical problem uh, the first time you do it. Um, there is a high rate of recurrence in these, especially in the kid like that as a wrestler who wants to go back to wrestling or a football player or, and young. So about 85% recurrence has been reported in the young population uh, with shoulder dislocation. So there are some people in some studies that may advocate uh, primary repair after the first dislocation on that particular type of person, but they're really not valid. Most of them are out of the military, and they're really not applicable to society and probably not the standard of care, but you could make a certain argument for a wrestler. Chances of him not doing this again are very small. So when we treat these, there's sort of two separate types of shoulder instabilities. You got that kid there who's a traumatic one, and they typically unidirectional and typically anteriorly. 
They have a bank art tear and oftentimes end up in surgery. Yes, question? Mr. Senator, what are your comments about uh, before you um, plan the use of the seed, ensure that there isn't a fact that there is any incidence of fact uh, relatively minor? Okay, I think I'm, so what I was trying to say was, oh, yeah, the question, repeat the question, sorry. Yeah, the question was about uh, reducing the, the shortage location and, a fra and the issue of a fracture. And what, in a young person, it's extremely unusual to have a fracture like the humeral head or tuberosity with a dislocation. And an older person is a big, a big risk because the bone's not quite so, uh, not so, quite so strong. So what I was trying to say is after you reduce them, you want to make sure that they're A, reduced, and B, there's no other bony pathology on a young person. If it was an 80-year-old, you'd probably want to bring them in. Right, so maybe causing any kind of injury while reducing the shoulder is the question. And, and no, it's very low risk to reduce the shoulder. Even if there is a fracture, the risk is typically more that you're going to displace that fracture and cause them to have an operative problem when they had a non-operative problem. And that we've, we've done this before. We break the humeral head or complete the break, however you say, then all of a sudden you get a shoulder replacement when you had you know, a fracture that would have probably healed. So that's something that we have to be very careful about. So again, the traumatic ones are typically are the ones that would have surgery. Again, it's not necessarily the first time, but those are the patterns. And then the multiple dislocators are the multi-directional instability patients. Um, these typically are bilateral problems. They're oftentimes hyperlax in other places in their body. Um, rehabilitation is the mainstay of treatment. You really don't want to have to operate on these people because they just don't do very well. Um, they're always loose and tighten them up too much, they're unhappy there as well. So it's a really a highly intensive rehab uh, issue and really, really rehab for their entire lives. Um, there's some overlap in how we treat these people, but generally speaking, your traumatic ones end up more likely in surgery. Your atraumatic or multidirectionals typically can be managed non-operatively. And the non-operative management for these is basically, as we say, getting your motion back, getting your strength back. And the strength thing is really the rotator cuff and the surrounding muscles. It's, it's a dynamic stabilizing effect that you want to achieve. And you want to avoid during the course of your therapy um, the positions that are going to stress the shoulder. You don't want them abducted, external, and rotated right away because that's a stressful position. It's going to stress out the, uh, stretch out the capsule and whatnot. So you want to avoid the stressful positions for them. And who do we operate on? In my practice, basically, the people who fail non-operative management, and those are the people who either dislocate again or continue to complain of this shifting or instability feeling where they feel like the shoulder slides or perches on the edge. Those people aren't able to get back and do what they want to do, and those people are a reasonable fix. And then the young first-time dislocators, we talked about that before, it's controversial. I do not fix them right away. but. The reality is I see plenty of them that have a second dislocation and you wonder, maybe I should have fixed you. But I think, I think a lot of ones you don't see ever again, you forget about those kids because they don't come back. You only remember the ones that dislocate again. So again, I don't fix them all first time, but there are some people who do advocate for that. This is just a sort of a schematic with an arthrosc or a schematic overlay on an arthroscopy picture. And you see it, what's a typical bank heart tear. So this here is the labrum and there's the tear. Again, I can't see over there. Labrum's here, and this is the tear right through here. This is a very, very simple little problem surgically because it's sitting right there. It's just a little tear. It's not a big deal. Um, but that's where it happens. It usually happens anteriorly around the mid-equator of the glenoids where it starts. It usually goes inferiorly. And there's the tear itself. This is maybe from a scope. This is not that same person, but from a scope, this is a camera in the back on the left. This is a metal probe. And then what you see is the glenoid. Some more pointers here. here. But there's no labrum. should be kind of a big structure right here. There's nothing there. And again, nothing here. And the labrum should all be kind of going right through here. It's gone. It's missing. And you look, look from the back. You can't see it. You go from the front and turn the camera around. And all of a sudden, you see the labrum, which is hooked by that probe. So it's torn and it's all peeled off in medial now. So you can't see it from the back. Even if it does heal there, there's no reason to believe it's going to impart any stability because it's in the wrong place. 
And then when we repair them, this is one of the many different techniques to repair them, but this is one of the things we do. And what you're looking at this video is, again, camera in the back. The labrum is that structure that has a stitch coming through it. It's, and then okay, that's not it. And with this is a, a knotless technique of doing this. It's a pretty easy device. Um, there's a hole already drilled, and this is just going to basically take that labrum and roll it back up onto the guano where it's supposed to be and secure it. So when you when you this again starts depending on how the tear is, there's a lot of different ways of doing this, um, and this is just checking the stability, make sure it's tight enough. You don't put any put any tighter. And then you'll typically march right on up from the 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock position. You know, you may be putting three, four, five anchors, and it really depends on the pattern of the tear. But generally speaking, they tell you three anchors minimum for a labral re repair, but, you know, it could be upwards of seven, eight, nine, depending on how big of a tear it is. And there's another picture, uh, a little grainy, right with that, but basically you're looking at, on the front, the tear, on the top right, top uh, bottom left, and top and bottom right, excuse me, you see the repair with three different stitches that you can see on that. And again, the concept is securing that in multiple places so that you give a chance to heal back to the glenoid, and that will reapproximate both the labrum where it needs to be and also the tension on the ligaments. So when they do heal, they'll be tight enough. So before we move on to AC joint, any questions about shoulder instability, shoulder dislocations? No? Okay. So <clears throat> shoulder separation, a different, different entity than the dislocation. It's basically an acromioclavicular joint problem. And uh, picture on the left, this is a high-grade AC separation. You see someone who lands on their shoulder. Um, clavicle pops up. It can be tenting the skin. It can be pretty dramatic looking. Um, and then the, what happens on the right is basically you'll tear, when you have something this big, You'll tear both your acromioclavicular ligaments as well as your coracoclavicular ligaments. And that will allow basically the clavicle and the scapula to separate. And what really happens is the scapula and the shoulder and the weight of the arm goes inferiorly. The clavicle really doesn't necessarily spring superiorly. It's really the gravity and the weight of the arm pulling it down. But nonetheless, they separate, and the clavicle edge is what looks like it's prominent. These are very infrequent that they're that bad. They typically are very low grade and don't need surgery. And basically these are, you can play when tolerated. There's people who play professional football the week after they do this and they, you know, they're running back and you know, it just hurts. It's miserable, but you can live with it. It's not necessarily a problem. It can get worse, but once you're comfortable, you can play. But some of them aren't, aren't amenable to that. But how do we evaluate them? Basically you get x-rays of both shoulders. Because you want to see the distance between the clavicle and the coracoid, and we'll see that in a minute. And there's different types of views you can get that are more probably pertinent to the, uh, the x-ray tech. But nonetheless, um, axillary views, like we talked about before, the axillary ladder will also show you the clavicle and the acromion and make sure it's not anterior or posterior. And then uh, the Zanka view and then the notch view are other different ways you can look at the same joint. And just again, schematics of what happens. Type 1 generally is the sprain. It hurts. There's no cosmetic deformity. They're very, very painful if you touch their distal clavicle or push on their distal clavicle, but nothing cosmetic. Maybe a little bruising, but nothing else. And type 2, a bit more painful, a bit more swelling. You may have a very slight prominence, but really nothing too substantial because of the ligaments that go from the coracoid to your clavicle are still intact. They're stretched, strained, but they're, you know, they're, they're not... They're not um, completely torn. And if you go to the next sort of type, which is type three, they're torn. And these are when you really start to see deformity. Um, it's a cosmetic problem. It's not necessarily a surgical problem. There is some controversy. That, do you fix these as a type three or not? The general consensus is no. Test questions, answers is no. But there are some people who would say, on a throw or a quarterback or a pitcher, who really needs their proper scapulothoracic mechanics and their, and their shoulder mechanics, maybe you re, re, you know, restore that normal anatomy, but that's a very small subset of these people and you can still make an argument not to. Then you have 
types fours, fives, and sixes that are much less common, but types four go, type fours go posteriorly, so they're dislocated out the back, so they may not look so bad on an x-ray from the front. That's why you get the view from the, the axillary view, because you'll see that. Type fives are way high. These are the ones we typically will see that look really kind of grotesque, and these are the ones that do, you know, show up and need to be fixed. And then type sixes are inferior, very uncommon. In fact, I, they're reported, but I don't know anyone's ever seen one. But um, you know, what do we do with them? How do we treat them? Again, most of them don't need surgery. Most of them just a sling, anti-inflammatories, ice. When they're comfortable, they can go back. But in the past, they've tried pins to go through the acromion into the clavicle. They've tried screws, wires, and then they've all failed. Everything sort of historically has failed. The pins break. You see a broken pin on the left. There's a migrated pin into the chest on the middle section, and then a, a screw that's bent on the far right. So none of these options are all that good. So there's been some new things that we do, and here's one that's, I would say, um, between a grade three and a grade five. It's kind of a high grade three. The kid was miserable. He hated it. He's a very thin kid. Um, after a lot of conversations, we did fix him, but you can see on the, you know, the x-ray labeled R on the left side of the screen, the normal alignment between the clavicle and the acromion here. The space here is being very small versus this space here, really big. Okay, so again, if you can see over here, coracoclavicular distance very high versus this one here, which is very small. So that's showing you the clavicle and the coracle are separated. The CC ligaments are torn. And what we did with him was arthroscopically fix him. But you see a picture during surgery. And the only really pertinent part is the, the, uh, the drill bit that's coming from top to bottom that goes through the clavicle into the coracoid. And then the end result is a, what's called a tightrope, but you've got a metal button on the top of the clavicle and a metal button underneath the coracoid, which is a little harder to see. And it's basically a way the heavy suture cinches it down. So there's a little metal button here and here. And as you tie it, you just cinch that thing down here to here and you reduce that distance. It's called an AC joint tightrope. But, you know, the, it's, the concept is it's, it's a tension above and below, and you're just tie, tying it down. And the hope is that it will fill in with the scar from the old CC ligaments and provide stability. And this, it works. It does very well. But, again, not, not all of you need surgery. So, a you know, quick review. Type 1s and 2s, non-op. Type 3 is some debate, but generally speaking, type 3 is a non-surgical. Types 4s, 5s, and 6s are surgical and far less common. And these kids can go back and play, or any adult can go back and play, or do whatever they want to do as soon as they're comfortable. <clears throat> right, any questions? Yes. So if you, okay, what, what, the question was what happens late stage complications from an AC joint separation? And the biggest thing we see is chronic pain at the distal clavicle. So we'll see some of these type threes late that develop significant arthritis. Even type twos and types ones can. And they're generally very easily treatable with a distal clavicle excision. So you just go in and remove the distal centimeter or so of the clavicle. So you avoid that bone on bone pain. And that's usually very, very easy and satisfactory. But yeah, they are at higher risk for developing arthritis in that joint. Okay, so moving on, we'll talk about brachial plexus injuries and burners and stingers. These are far more common than anything else we've talked about so far. And basically, a stinger or burner is a transient unilateral radiating pain and paresthesias in the upper extremity with possible associated weakness, the definition that they've put out there. But basically, the kids, and it's typically football players, centers, interior linemen, those type of people, who will have impact, and their arm just drops, it's a complete dead arm. It just drops, they can't feel their arm, or it's numb, tingling, they can't, can't elevate it. They kind of run back to the huddle, run off the field, their arm hanging down low. And usually, in just a few minutes, it starts to work again. And they go back in and play, and they don't tell anybody. Or they keep playing and just let the arm hang and just, just deal with it, because it happens so often. And the people who do have this, happen, happen, <clears throat> excuse me, to people who do have this happen, typically have it happen again and again. So the mechanism is, is traction on the brachial plexus, or it could be compression of the brachial plexus, or a direct blow. <clears throat> excuse me. And again, A kind of shows your head getting twisted away from the shoulder, and traction on the plexus. B would just be the compression where you'd hit 
which is far less common, but you hit right up here, and then if you go the other side, just hit impact your neck, you can have a compression to the plexus. And that's a very, they're both, the A and C are very, very typical mechanisms to have this happen. Is the upper trunk that gets injured typically? Um, the uh, C5 and 6 are the ones, the nerves are typically involved. And when can they go back and play? So if this is a kid in a football field, once they come off the field, they can get their arm up over their head, their strength's symmetrical, they can play, assuming they have no neck pain, no headaches, anything like that, headaches, neck pain, blurry vision, you're thinking concussion as well, but, um, or you're thinking neck injury, but once they have no neck pain, full motion of the neck, symmetrical strength, they can go back and play. And that could be a couple plays, it could be the next series, it could be six weeks. You know, we don't know. We really can't predict it, but what we do know is if you go back and play too soon and have it happen again right away before you recover, much like br brain injury, if you don't recover, the nerve gets hit again, that second hit syndrome type of thing does take effect and they can be out for a really long time or potentially never come back. In fact, I've got neighbors, an interesting story, I have a neighbor kid who came to see me. I was working in my yard, he's kind of walked over with his dad and he was hurt on Friday night, we had a stinger, went back to practice on Saturday. They were just doing run-throughs or whatever, and he got, he was a wide receiver, and he got hit. Not hard, it was not just helmets only, and just got hit him. And uh, he came, you know, could, couldn't get his arm much more than 30, 40 degrees up. You know, just couldn't do it. And, you know, we watched him and watched him, and, you know, it's years, three, four years later, he's still weak. You know, he still can't get his arm fully extended. I mean, you can do a pass, but he's never regained his strength. It's been, you know, he's now a sophomore, junior in college, was a senior year in high school. And, and he basically got the second injury. He didn't tell anybody. He got a second injury, and he's never recovered. He's had MRIs, his neck, his break up, everything, but he just has some inflammation around the plexus, but physically never really recovered. And this is really because, put it on him, but he didn't, didn't tell anybody. He got hit again. So they're important that you really evaluate them and do not let them go back until they're ready. So again, um, Questions on burners or stingers? We will see them. You'll see them any time you're covering sports. You're going to see these things, and they're very easy to manage. And the default is always you can't go back and play. It's always a safe answer. Let, let, let it settle down. But okay. So rotator cuff tears. One of the things we see more commonly in the office than anything else is rotator cuff pathology, whether it be impingement or whether it be just you know shoulder pain or whether it's a full-on rotator cuff tear. Uh, we see a ton of shoulder pain in the office, and the ma vast majority of it's rotator cuff associated. So the rotator cuff muscles, the subscapularis is the, the large muscle in the front, some of the strongest of the muscles, and it provides internal rotation strength, okay? So if you're internally rotating your arm, that's your subscapularis. Then superiorly, you have three muscles starting from the front, going towards the back, you have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor. And then in this picture, you've got the biceps tendon splitting the subscapularis in the front. So just from a subscap standpoint, it's here. Biceps is here. Supraspinatus is here. Again, biceps in the groove here. Subscap and supraspinatus, OK? And you can't really see the rest of them in the back. So who do we see with this problem? Typically or historically, it's old people. You know, older population comes in, they can't, you know, can't elevate or they can't sleep well or they can't you know, play tennis anymore, whatever it may be, but shoulder pain in the, old, in the elderly, elderly population. But generally speaking, over the course of the last probably 10 years or so, we're seeing more and more rotator cuff tears in younger and younger patients. Um, and defining young is difficult, frankly, but some of the ways we define young is in how, how they behave. And there's a study back in shoulder and elbow surgery Look at the average age of their rotator cuff repairs was 62, and that was certainly far younger than historically, but 50% of those patients were planning to go back to play sports. Now, they may be tennis and golf or whatever it may be, but nonetheless, they were active 62-year-olds, so they expected recovery and functional recovery. But it is quite rare in the under 40 population. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I'm going to tie back to the shoulder dislocations. If you happen to see a patient who is over 40, and that's not an arbitrary number, but it's, you know, you can kind of use your judgment, who comes to your office with a shoulder dislocation, they're seen in the emergency room, reduced, they come to your office, the 40-year-old and over, you have to be very, very concerned about the possibility that they have a rotator cuff tear. So the, the 15, 20-year-old tears their labrum or has a bank heart tear, the 40-year-old or older 
tears the rotator cuff. And those are potentially, if you miss them, unrecoverable because they'll tear, they'll be big tears, they're traumatic, and the tendons are strong, the muscle strong, it retracts, and then you can't get it back. So if you miss the sort of the middle age older person with the shoulder dislocation and the rotator cuff tear, it is sometimes not recoverable. And you end up salvage procedures like reverse shoulder replacements and those type of things. So that's an important population to probably not treat in your office without an MRI confirming that the rotator cuff's okay. And if they're not okay, you gotta send them out. But back to this. So, you know, there's a lot of things you wanna know. Acute versus chronic. Traumatic, we see a lot of these with falls, car accidents, those type of things in the trauma center, but most of them are atraumatic overuse type of injuries. Um, they typically complain of pain. They roll over at night, they wake up with pain, or it affects their ability to sleep through the night. Um, it can radiate anywhere, so just because it radiates into the arm or into the neck doesn't mean really much to me. Um, but they complain of pain radiating frequently. Um, history, you know, they don't all have the classic overuse, you know, overuse injuries, but a lot of them are dominant extremities and a lot of them have been through heavy labor or repetitive work type of things. And then um, the patient will have difficulty performing overhead activities. They can't do things they used to do. So it's a very common presentation. It doesn't have to be rotator cuff tear. It can be just inflammation or impingement, but this is the people that come in to see you with this type of problem. Um, on exam, there's numerous different exam findings, but typically what they're going to have, and we can go through this a little bit later, is painful arc of motion. So as they come up this way, and they get to a certain point, whether it's 50, 60 degrees, or 90 degrees, they have pain. Um, Near and Hawkins and Job tests are different things they can do. We can do um, just passively elevating them, like a near test. Hawkins says bringing them up and rotating them this way. And all these things are sort of engaging the tuberosity underneath the acromion, and then if they're causing pain, they're just in, in their in you know, in and of themselves they're not perfect. But if you put them all together, they work pretty well to really define what's going on. The Job test is again a similar type of thing, which is they're all getting the same thing, which is going to be pain with the uh, thumb down and resisting elevation. Um, those are all tests. That, they'll be painful. Anybody's got inflammation in the shoulder too, so they're helpful, but they're not absolutely perfectly diagnostic. Weakness. Weakness is a big problem. If you see somebody who's weak, if you examine me and say, I can't resist, you know, forward elevation, or I can't resist external rotation, or internal rotation, can't re you know, then there's a problem. Because the rotator cuff, when you get your arms in a stable position, you know, is relatively strong. So if you get somebody and you can sit there and break their strength real easily, you know, you're holding out this way, and you know, your left arm you can't move, the right arm just kind of falls in, it's a big problem because you should never be able to break someone that easily. So if you see weakness on an exam, you have to be thinking either tear or neurological abnormality is typically a tear. So again, differentiating rotator cuff tear versus impingement is hard though because they'll complain of very similar things. People with impingement won't have pain, won't have weakness, but they'll be hurting bad enough sometimes that they just can't participate. So you say, well, you feel weak, but is it just pain or is it true muscular weakness? And those are, that's hard to, to sort out sometimes. So, you know, the use of an MRI. MRIs are, are great for rotator cuffs. They really pick up a tremendous amount of pathology. Are they necessary on everybody? No, um, but we do use them frequently. Um, patients who come with acute onset symptoms, normal shoulder, you know, fell off my bike and I, you know, pain, yeah, they'll get an MRI, absolutely. Um, they're failing, they come to you, they've been through therapy, they've been on anti inflammatories had injections. Yeah, absolutely, an MRI is appropriate. Um, weakness. You get an MRI without doubt. Young patients with shoulder pain almost all get an MRI. Assuming they've you know done some basic things and they're, you know, you know it's not the first day they hurt, but. When you're talking about the retraction mm -hmm. um, of the muscle, how soon does that happen? Is it just a week? Are you talking about sure. trying to get them in? Are you worried that it won't be? Is it going to be more of a salvage procedure? Right. How quick was that? Question was about retraction, presuming the traumatic tears, how fast and, and how. Uh, how fast and how dramatic is the retraction? And it could be the time of injury as far as when it happens, and it will get worse. So if you think about the tendons torn off the bone, the muscle continues to fire, pulls on the tendon, it just keeps shortening, there's nothing to ever bring it back. Usually it goes back because it's attached to the bone, so as you move the arm one way or the other, there's something to bring it back. But there's no, no recoil, but it will never go back. Um, we'll see retraction early. And the people who have these big cuff tears will typically come in with a dislocated shoulder and, and just to shrug their shoulder, they can't, they can't get their arm off the side. And they typically have torn two, three, sometimes, you know, usually not four, but two or three of the tendons. 
And it's a very difficult thing to fix, but if you fix them, they can do well. Even if they're 75 years old, they can still do well because they've had an acute injury. Now, they won't all do well, but, but you still should fix them. And if you want timing, I'd rather fix them two or three weeks than, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you know, three or four months, it gets really kind of hard. So how do you manage them? Not all rotator cuff tears need surgery. We're fixing more and more of them generally, but not all need surgery. Anti-inflammatories, therapy, typically will get people significantly better function and pain relief. Injections certainly are an option. A cortisone shot in the subacromial space is definitely a reasonable thing to do. Um, traditionally, people were injected just until they failed everything, and then they had a scope and they couldn't fix the rotator cuff. And that, that, that old sort of way of doing things is gone now. But, but one injection, therapy, anti-inflammatories, a lot of people without a tear will get better or a small tear will get better. Um, but what you don't want to do is continue to inject them every three, four, five, six months, and then all of a sudden have a massive tear that you can't fix and they're 55, 60 years old. You're much better off fixing the tear early if you need to. Um, activity modification, obviously the things that they're Causing, or causing the pain, don't let them do. If they're tennis players, they can't serve or whatever. If they're doing overhead work, they need to be off of work. They need to be able to rest the thing and re recover. Um, but pain relief, increased range of motion can be achieved in over half the patients with non-operative management. These are not massive tears like we were talking about. These are the small partial tears or, or even uh, small full thickness tears or even partial tears, but the bigger tears probably do need to be fixed. And then the people who we do fix, the primary indication Traditionally, for fixing a rotator cuff tear is relief of pain. They come to you complaining of shoulder pain. That's the main complaint. They don't come to you complaining of weakness. Typically, they don't realize they're weak. They don't come take, talking about rotator cuff tears. They come because they hurt. Um, you know, the people we fix large traumatic tears. Absolutely fix them all. Um, if they've had, no, they've had nothing but shoulder pain for 20 years, they have a long-standing cuff, that's different. But, but the, the normal patient has a new onset pain and a large tear you fix. Chronic tears that are not improving, you fix them. And then any, any young patient with a rotator cuff tear should be fixed. And young, I'd say young, is, you're probably talking under 60. You know, small tear, even just fix them. It's easier to fix them and recover than it is to deal with a big tear or even talk about shoulder replacements, you know, when they're 65. And the evolution of the repair has gotten, <coughs> gotten so that the operation, although a big operation internally, is, still, is not anywhere near as big as it used to be. Um, they've went from these open incisions where they opened up the arm, took down the deltoid muscle and exposed everything to now it's done arthroscopically. And the arthroscopic results are certainly favorable to the open and mini open repair techniques and um, patient satisfaction is higher, their pain relief and improvement of function are higher as well. So the arthroscopic repairs are overtaking the mini open or the open repairs as far as patient outcomes and what's being done these days. This is an arthroscopic picture of, a, we'll see some video in a moment, but of the, ste you know, the steps of, of the repair. You're going to plan what you're going to do. You're going to place your anchors, um, pass your stitches, then tie them, and then plus or minus fix them with another row. And this, this picture here, for purposes of getting yourself situated, rotator cuff is here, so the glenoid would be over here. Rotator cuff is here. Humeral head laterally is here, so this is all over top of the rotator cuff footprint. This is a little cannula coming in from the side. These are the stitches here. So again, rotator cuff tendon here that was torn off. We'll see that in a moment. A couple stitches. Footprint is which was where we attached the rotator cuff. Okay, that's underneath this now. A little bit of the bone from the lateral portion of the humerus. And then this is the cannula coming in from the lateral side of the shoulder. So this is the same patient prior to fixation, you got an anchor in the bone, and then the stitches are coming straight out from the anchor, so they're incorporated into the anchor. Would you describe that as a massive tear? Uh, I would, no, I would not call it, that, I don't have a measurement for that tear, that's probably about a centimeter and a half, two centimeters. So you start getting massive tears, we're talking either two tendon tears, or say three, four centimeters. So it probably wouldn't be a massive tear. A little bit of chronic looking, the tissues, you know, the tissues look a little flimsy, a little bit more chronic, but not a massive tear. In a massive tear, you'd almost be looking at the entire humeral head. It's right, highly magnified. Yeah, highly magnified, without a doubt. 
didn't work last time. Let's soon try this here. So this metal device that coming in from the side is just a, it's just a tissue grabber. This sort of lets you figure out where does the tendon want to go? Because it's a geometry problem to some degree. You've got to figure out how this tear needs to get reapproximated with, without too much tension and getting a good coverage of that rotator cuff footprint. And the footprint part is where the anchor is, basically. And it's about a centimeter and a half from medial to lateral. So it's a big, broad area where the rotator cuff attaches. So that's sort of getting a feel for where we need to be. And then this is a company. Numerous companies have devices. This is just a device we get to stitch. It's going to come underneath the tendon in this device, and this allows you to pass a stitch from low or deep to superficial, and you can kind of feel where you want to put it, and you kind of know where your tension is going to be, and then you can pass this device, and this will put the stitch up through the tendon, and you'll go grab that stitch from that blue cannula in the front, and then you'll keep, keep repeating this process until you have all your anchors and all your stitches placed where they need to be. And this is where we're jumping ahead a little bit to where you see the blue stitch is tied. You got a knot kind of the bottom left of your screen. You see a little knot in the mid top of the screen, the white stitch. So these are already tied. So that's right above that first anchor we placed. Now, the anchor that we placed would be somewhere in here now. Okay, so you got all this extra tissue here, which we have to deal with, which is a good problem. But that's the concept of this. So the anchor would be right about here. So you have all this rotator cuff here that's still available to work with. So this is what we call a double row type of fixation. Oops, excuse me. Where we'll take that extra stitch and we'll put tension on it, I think. And you can see what this will do is we'll increase the amount of that rotator cuff tendon that's being compressed onto the bone. So instead of just having the knots and be the one point of fixation, you get the knots plus the stitches, so you have a far more surface area of rotator cuff attached to the bone and far more stability of your construct. So the, you've got multiple anchors in different planes holding it together. So it's a far more stable construct. It doesn't mean they're all going to do better than a simple repair, but biomechanically it's far superior and the results are starting to show over the course of years that the results are a bit better too. Um, but nonetheless, it's a little bit more complex, a little more costly because there's multiple anchors and whatnot. But certainly an option is you know, double row fixation. So questions about rotator cuffs? So the question is, say, a 50-year-old who comes in with shoulder pain, suspected rotator cuff tear, uh, what do you do with them day one? Now, in my office, you can come into my office with that 50-year-old shoulder pain for two weeks, or you can come in with a 50-year-old who's had six months of therapy, two injections, medications, three opinions. And you can have anywhere in between. Well, let's talk about the person who comes in, like you kind of insinuated, it hasn't really had much of a workup. Um, if you're 50 years old, shoulder pain, and your exam is consistent with a rotator cuff tear, I will get an MRI on you. And the reason for that is if you don't have, I don't want to operate on you if I don't have to. But I don't want to miss the tear by injecting you and sending you to therapy. So if I'm suspicious for the tear, I'll get the MRI. If the MRI comes back with a full thickness tear, I'll take it, take it surgery. If the MRI comes by with just a, a partial thickness tear, so there's still continuity of the tendon, I will treat you with an injection and therapy. And I would say in the absence of a tear, 75, 85% of the people without a tear can achieve you know, normal or near normal functional results with the injection and therapy. I think the injection is a, a means to an end for me. It helps relieve their pain so they can do the things they need to do in therapy. It's not curative in any way. Um, I think the therapy and the time is probably the best part of it, but the injection we use because they're hurting and it helps them participate. If you come to me with the other end of the spectrum, where you've had uh, workup, anti-inflammatories, plus mass injection, therapy, and you're still having pain, I'm suspicious, I'll just take you to surgery. Because at that point, we can get an MRI, but what are we going to do with it? You're still complaining of all the same things. Your MRI didn't cure you, so you're still going to have surgery. So there's really no point in doing the MRI at that, at that point. And if there is a tear, 
We fix it while we're there. If there's not a tear, we just do a debridement, maybe remove some bone spurs, clean up some inflamed bursa. Um, but the, the MRI is probably not necessary then. So it's somewhat of a judgment call. Yes? Um, there's not really a consensus other than there should be some period of immobilization. Whether I, I typically do abduction pillow for four weeks and then a simple sling for the next two um, and then out of the sling. I do no therapy at all and for the first two weeks and then when I see them back in the office for their first post-op check, I will send them to therapy. And the therapy is just passive motion, it's just to avoid getting stiff. Um, that will go for about four weeks, and then they'll start the active assist with pulleys and whatnot uh, for the next four weeks, and then at about eight weeks postoperatively, they'll start initiating active motion. I'm probably a bit more aggressive than some of my partners about that. Some of them are six weeks, no motion at all. Um, what I've, my personal opinion is I find they get too stiff. Um, I was at a meeting last week, and there was a discussion back and forth about it, and there was sort of an argument about early mobilization versus immobilization. And, the general feeling for people who immobilize was I can deal with stiffness later, but if you read terror, it's a far bigger problem. And it's true, I mean, it's, you can't argue that point. Um, but from my standpoint, you try to find that sweet spot and, and every once in a while you do and you're the hero and when you don't, you got a stiff person or, or a re-terror. But, but you know, it, it's an art to some degree, knowing how big their tear was, how their tissues were, how compliant they are, there's a lot of it that can weigh in. But, I do two weeks for any therapy, four, but four weeks total in the immobilizer. And I don't, think, I don't think moving them right away is appropriate. I think that's not, that's not a good thing for them from a healing standpoint. Do you, do you rotate your chest like if you fix them? Are they going to recur in five years or something? They can. So there are studies that show re tear. Okay, the question was um, are they going to re tear? If you fix them today, are they going to re tear in five years or some other period of time? And, and the retear rates in the literature have been anywhere from you know three, four, five percent to ninety percent, depending on, I mean, a million different factors: how big the tears are, the older population, the type of therapy. So there's a lot of variables. But generally speaking, the retear rates are lower and lower every year. It seems, and I think part of that is the technology that's allowed us to get better fixation with the anchors, the different constructs. There's been a lot of things that have advanced that that are helping us do our job and make our make our lives easier. Um, your chances of re-tearing five years, if you get it to heal, are small. But the, I think the re-tears most likely didn't totally heal. And that they probably, at some point, gave way, as opposed to having it complete heal and then re-injure or re-tear. So I think the re-tears are probably mischaracterized, and they should be probably incomplete healing that started to manifest with pain again. You could overdo it or re-injure it, and if it never, if it hasn't healed to begin with, then you may never, you know, it may just may may recur in regards to the symptoms. And some of the studies even looked at the healing and their outcomes. And there wasn't a lot of association, so you could have a, you could go back with an ultrasound or an MRI or a diagnostic scope and say, you know, Joe's rotator cuff didn't heal, but then you look at his clinical exam and say, well, he's 100 percent better. He's back working uh, in construction. He hasn't had pain in five years. Well, how do you reconcile that? I mean, it, it, but we, we can't. So why people have pain again or re-tear, it's, it's unknown. But typically, it's because they didn't heal. So we have a few more minutes here. So pediatric shoulder injuries, we see a ton of kids. Every, everyone sees a ton of kids in their office because there's just a ton of, ton of kids getting hurt. Um, but baseball season is kind of pertinent because we see a lot of pediatric shoulder injuries this time of year. And basically, what these are typically are overuse. Um, very uncommon for a kid, and I say a kid, say a 16-year-old or under, to have any intra-articular pathology, um, dislocations, cartilage injuries, tendon tears, those type of things. It's typically mechanics issues. They're pitching or throwing wrong, or they're just doing too much of it. The first thing you have to think of every time you see a kid um, it's something we all know, but it's always self remind is, is growth plane injuries. So the physial injuries, if a kid comes in with shoulder pain and he's a pitcher or elbow pain, you've got to get x-rays and look for, does he, you know, does he have a growth plate injury? 
um, and then basically shut them down. Um, there's no indication to let somebody throw or continue to play sports at that, this age through pain. So what we see a lot is little league or shoulder. It's basically a physial injury. It's got, you know, a little bit older kids, they start throwing a little harder. Um, their arm hurts. Um, one of the things we do about this is limiting the pitch counts to try to prevent this from happening and limiting pitch types. So different types of pitches, different ages, or different numbers of pitches. This is just a USA Baseball. There's tons of different recommendations. This doesn't apply to you know, Ohio youth or Little League, the different pitch counts for them. But this is, there's a tons of different recommendations, but they're all basically getting at the same thing, which is limiting exposure of the kid. And then the x-rays. You know, the one on the right, you see the growth plate normally here, and this wider here. So this is a kid who's got shoulder pain, he's throwing, and he's got a growth plate that's normal on the, on the you know, left of your screen and wide here. That kid needs to stop throwing. You put him in a sling, shut him down, he needs to stop playing baseball or whatever sport he's playing and let this thing heal. Otherwise, he ends up with a either growth problem, growth arrest, or a fracture that continues and ends up being a bigger problem. And th these, are, these are things we can solve easily by being a little bit stern in the office and shutting people down. Female throwers, they've been largely ignored uh, in the past, but as the girls are playing more and more sports and softball uh, pitchers are starting to have more and more injuries, um, this is starting to follow the similar, or not the, not the same, but somewhat similar recommendations for how many pitches girls can throw, because they let girls throw their arms until they're dead, even in college now, but they're starting to come up with some more, more ideas on how to fix this. And then uh, moving on, this we have very little time, clavicle fractures. Sort of the last of the things we're going to talk about. Most of these, again, don't need surgery. A lot of these will heal up very well, and uh, especially in the young patient. Put them in a sling. I don't think they need any fancy, fancy immobilizers. And if they're even in the ballpark, the two ends of the bone will heal together. Um, some do need surgery, however. The ones that are really short or deformed or tenting the skin or pop through the skin, you know, they're, they're, they're a different subset. But here's an example of a uh, clavicle fracture here. It does not need surgery. It's clavicle here. Got, it's, it's kind of common, but generally lines up pretty well right here. Again, it's not a young person in this particular picture, but the clavicle fracture there looks great. Then you got one here. It doesn't look so great. So this is a, a younger person happens to be, but you see this big spike of bone here. Skin's right there. It's very close. It's not out the skin, but it's close. And you see this person, you'll see a big spike sticking up on their skin. Um, you know, those probably ought to be fixed. And those are typically fixed with plates and screws. There's lots of ways to do it uh, as far as uh, where you put your plates or you put a little rod inside. It doesn't really matter. But the concept is, you know, they probably need to be fixed to get them to heal. So, okay. Well, I think we're out of time. Is there any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much.